So welcome. We're going to continue now with Chapter 7, Event Animation. And this is uh, maybe the most famous quote in all of 3D by uh, Andy Van Dam, who's uh, one of the uh, co-authors of a very famous computer graphics text called Computer Graphics Principles and Practice, also known as the Graphics Bible. Uh, because it was uh, so important in the, in the formation of 3D, so many people used it. Uh, I saw one of the co-authors uh, at SIGGRAPH two years ago, and he said, oh, no, the Old Testament. <laughs> so I guess we're all working on some of the newer uh, books. In any case, Andy uh, was uh, one of the pioneers of SIGGRAPH. Indeed, he founded uh, the uh, SIGGRAPH Society. He gave a, a, a stellar talk at the uh, SIGGRAPH Pioneers reception uh, meeting this, uh, last month in LA. And uh, I think this is a really important quote because it says that uh, it doesn't matter if your picture started as 3D, if it's just sitting there, it's just a picture. You can't tell. I mean, I'm, I'm looking out at all of you folks in, in class right now. Uh, you could look out the window, you could look at any number of things. If you take a picture of that, it looks just the same. It's the ability to move and spatialize and see the difference in what you're up to that's so critically important. Uh, last Friday, as, as our, part of our class field trip, we uh, uh, saw a great flick. We saw the U2 3D concert movie, and it was really interesting. Uh, did you guys notice anything about the camera work? in that movie? Always moving. Always moving. Never stopped because otherwise it just locks in place. But it's that change of point of view, change in the activity that shows you the 3D perspective at work and, and lets your mind snap in and start tracking and recognizing that stuff. Very important. Okay, once again we've uh, followed the standard organization in this chapter on how do we cover all the material. And so uh, here are the topics. We're going to see uh, how routes connect events between nodes to cause and affect the animation that we're interested in. We'll see uh, that there's actually a design pattern which occurs over and over again to make sense of this, to make it a very deliberate process for how we do it. And then we look at the time sensor node, which is uh, also our clock, our clock node that uh, keeps track of how things work, and then a variety of uh, uh, interpolators that uh, drive things around. The interpolators are producer nodes that output the events. Okay, so to get going here, let's uh, get our terms of reference straight. Two, uh, once again, important definitions, and that would be behavior and event. Okay, so uh, behavior is uh, an interesting word in that you can see it used in all sorts of contexts in all sorts of different ways. And uh, I want to get very precise about what the meaning of behavior here it will be in, in this context so that we can use it precisely because that will be very helpful. And given that you have a scene graph which has different geometry and different colors and different textures and different transformations and all the things necessary to put together a scene, then we're going to call a behavior anything that changes a value in that scene graph. Okay? Now there are a variety of things that can change that. There are uh, different animation nodes. There are uh, nodes that sense user interaction. Or even some nodes that listen to the network and get values from that. And then the route statement is what connects these event producers and hooks them back up to event receivers. But the bottom line remains, what we're trying to do is change the scene graph. So if we define behavior as our atomic term, our simplest possible term for how do we change a value, then if we get good, we become adept at changing a value, producing a behavior, 
and we can change anything in the scene graph. Furthermore, since practically all of the scene graph is modifiable, that means our conception of what is animatable is limited only by what could our scene graph be. So what till now has been a, a pretty static structure that's just putting this thing here and that thing there and applying a color suddenly <laughs> becomes wide open to any type, of uh, any type of animation that we can imagine, any type of change to that. Okay, so behavior is fundamental in what we're doing. Next is the event, and that is the precise value that get passed, gets passed from one input to one output. One goes, goes out of, hooks up to a goes into. It uh, moves things along, and that is how we affect those changes in the scene graph that we're trying to produce. Okay, so um, given that, Given that model of how things work, we could say, how does this uh, occur on the scene? Well, first of all, there's a fundamental computer graphics concept called double buffering. And that's what the first bullet is referring to. And what, what we're saying is each frame each image that's placed on the screen shows a snapshot of what the scene graph is trying to say. Not just the geometry and all the objects, but also where is the camera looking at it. That frame, that snapshot is our picture of it. Now, what does not happen is having the computer running around and changing a pixel there and a couple of pixels there and modifying it piecemeal. Instead, what happens is it's a very deliberate process. While that frame is up on your screen, the browser is continuing on and it ticks over the time step, ticks over the clock and says, all right, my camera's moved a little bit, the scene graph might have been modified in a little bit, let's take another picture. Boom. And when it's done taking that picture, that's when it gets swapped out and put on the frame buffer, put in front of the user. So, and the other one's push, pushed to the back where it gets redrawn. Okay, so you can think of this as sort of like a, a, a two-frame uh, video where first one and then the other and then the one and then the other and then the one and then the other are repeatedly swapped. Each time one is just there in front of you, the other is getting drawn to. And this way we can avoid any messiness, any artifacts while we're drawing the image and prevent those uh, undesired things from getting in front. What is it that makes it look fast, makes it look like motion, is when we can swap those buffers fast enough that we uh, achieve the perception of smooth motion. Usually the goal for that, the uh, physiologists tell us seven to eight frames per second, seven to eight hertz. Usually we aim for 10 or at least 15 uh, hertz. Some gamers will go even higher than that. Uh, faster is always better just about always better, except if it's maybe too fast to see and it's subtracting from your, uh, some other experience like physics updates, okay? So that's what we're up to, double buffering, switching frames. Okay, so given that very consistent uh, setup, which is consistent with uh, most 3D programs, how they work, then our event model how do we update the scene graph consists of a, f a few different things. First, it means looking around. What has changed in the scene? Has the user navigated the position to a different location? Have they clicked on something? Have they rotated it? Have they simply put the mouse over it? Do I sense a position of something there? And so each time a, an activity like that occurs, it generates an event value which in turn would have to be routed or passed somewhere in the scene. And so the event model for a browser consists of going through that, looking at all the events that are produced by clocks, produced by the user, produced by activities in the scene. And then once those are all captured, we propagate them. We push them through to the scene graph and make all the changes necessary. It's time then to, given that updated scene graph, guess what we do? 
Oh yeah, we take another picture. We fill in that back buffer on the double buffer, and when that picture is complete, we swap it in front and then repeat the process one after another. So very consistent, very common approach to how to do 3D graphics. Okay, now when you start putting these things together, they look uh, often very similar, the structures. And that structure might not be immediately evident when you're going through it because there's so many nodes, there's so many ways to order things. We, uh, people can put their routes at different places in the scene. It's not always clear that there's any rhyme or reason to this business. But in fact, there is. And so we see here on the example behavior event chain slide that, uh, for example, if a user clicks a button to start a clock, that would be an example of a trigger node. Something, a node that's listening for user input like that and saying, aha, I have been started. I am going to kick off a chain of events. Okay, so that trigger might then turn on a clock, which is going to output things, not just once, but repeatedly, uh, so that it can drive the rest of the scene. Okay, and that in turn will produce a uh, linear interpolation function. So what does that mean? Well, it's basically the black box model. It's some kind of function that gets an input and massages it, modifies it, and then produces an output. And then we send that to our target node, which is somewhere in the scene graph. Okay, so here's the pattern. It's very cause and effect. It starts at one place, it moves through a couple of, of modifiers, and it ends up changing our scene graph. This uh, repetition is going to be very helpful to us. Okay, so now what's a route? The route uh, looks like a node in your scene. It's a statement in the language. Uh, so it'll have an angle bracket around it, uh, just like a transform or a box or a material node might have. However, it's not a node per se. It's not something that gets drawn. It's not something that contains information on its own. Rather, it defines a connection between something that has an output connecting up to something else that has an input. And so that output value is what gets passed along, gets routed along the path to the destination. And uh, implicit in there, built into the process is the fact that there's a timestamp that accompanies it. And this is mostly for internal housekeeping um, uh, so that a browser can uh, keep track of what's happening when also keep track of causality and ordering. And sometimes that time value itself is, is useful to us. We take advantage of it. Uh, uh, it might be useful to uh, review. What's the, what's the definition of time? Anybody know the definition of time? That's, it's okay, it's a trick question. The, the, the answer is uh, time is the thing that keeps everything from happening at once. Oh, well, that sounds pretty silly in the real world, but in terms of our program, oh, yes, that is very important. If everything happened at once, then our initial screen would be what it started, and our second screen would be, here's what it is when you're all done. How boring. If it ain't moving, it ain't 3D. We want to see those transitions. We want to have direct control over time. Maybe speed it up, maybe slow it down, but definitely have causality, cause and effect throughout. Okay, so what's next? Very important, and I'll say this about 18 times, so, uh, so you need to remember it. And also, you can't blame me if you don't, but uh, very important is that the data types must match. Uh, 
we're a strongly typed language, we must have values coming out then going in that fit, that make sense, that match. Okay? It turns out, in, ter in addition to the data type matching, we also have a thing called access type, which has to match as well. Not match directly, but match logically. Okay? And the access type will define uh, whether something is an input or an output or maybe both. Some, some mix of the two, okay? And so we did uh, review these, or at least summarize these in chapter one. You see the review note on some of these slides, because that's where the slides first appeared. They're duplicates, but this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where we f first start really using these capabilities. Okay, so uh, cross-check now, a double-check on our terminology. Uh, all right, behavior, got that. That's changing a value somewhere. And the event is when we send a value around from some output off to some input node. Now we can have more than one event at a time that might be generated in between the drawing of these two frames. So we refer to that multiple set of values getting routed as an event cascade. Sometimes those event cascades, usually they're considered just within a single timestamp where one causes another, causes another, causes another. Occasionally we'll see events that provoke things over time, but usually we just focus on what immediate reactions occur. Okay, now uh, um, here's, here's another uh, bad joke. Did anybody hear how fast the new Japanese supercomputer is? It can perform an infinite loop in five seconds. Okay, and this is why, you know, you don't see computer scientists telling jokes on, on uh, television. But uh, uh, why do we care about loops? Well, infinite loops sound like and look like if you go under the hood, my goodness, everything is so busy. But of course, nothing happens, okay? Because it's doing the same thing over and over. A corollary definition, I think it's been credited to uh, uh, Albert Einstein, has is, is been, what's the, the definition of insanity? Definition of insanity is uh, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, okay? so. We want, to invo we want to avoid that whole scenario. It's, it's, it's insane. We don't, we don't want loops. We don't want infinite or even uncontrolled loops. So one thing that's built in there, we'll see, is we don't allow loops. And there's a pretty clever mechanism that makes sure that that can happen without it being very expensive computationally. All right. So how do we take advantage of this? Well, here's our design pattern again. I think that uh, thinking in terms of the design pattern helps you make sense of just, uh, just about all of the different combinations of nodes that you could put together here. And because there's one size that does fit just about all, this basic pattern here with an optional initial trigger and then a uh, clock to drive the events over time. Dotted lines here meaning optional. And then uh, the interpolator to produce values. And then the target of the behavior, what gets changed in the scene graph, what we're trying to do in the first place this is something that you should try to apply to everything you do. Now, since that can be a little bit abstract by itself, and you say, well, my goal in life is not to write routes. My goal is to draw something cool in X3D. Well, it often helps to uh, draw this out uh, on a piece of paper and sketch through what the different uh, possibilities might be. Okay, 
And often we find ourselves uh, using this process not just on small scenes, but on big scenes, scenes that compose lots of things together. So besides drawing what does it look like, we can, we can uh, draw how does the user interact with it. You know, sure, we want it to be moving. We want it to be 3D moving so the user can interact. But unless they're driving, it's a lot less interesting. It becomes a passive experience, more like watching a, a movie. So one of the greatest strengths of 3D is interaction. So uh, we pay, we pay uh, particular attention to can we achieve that interaction effectively. That's a good thing to do at the design stage when you're sketching these out. And then uh, finally, when you put a series of these drawings together, little vignettes helping illustrate what are the key places, the key scenes, it not only helps us put it together piece by piece, but it helps us tell the story. So storyboarding is the term used in the, certainly in the movie industry and a lot of the, the game folks. A storyboard is where you say what are the key vignettes, the key pictures that indicate the change in action over time as the story progresses. It may be the user's story who's drawing us through, driving us through this thematic art. Try again here. Okay. So what's next? Data types. Okay, uh, this is a review slide again from chapter one, the overview. And so far we've sort of paid attention to data types just to make sure we put in the right values for things. But uh, we had some help before in that the tool would immediately validate whether or not we put in a good value or not, or at least a legal value. Now we have to pay a little more attention to it because we not only want to pay attention to what's the data type of the source, but we also want to pay attention to what's the data type of the target, the node that's receiving this event. Okay, So it is good to uh, become familiar with all the data types. Uh, I apologize for the nomenclature. SF is single field. MF is multiple field. I uh, I begged and hollered at people to change those. We had our chance when we went from Vermal to X3D3O, but believe it or not, the, uh, the gurus were too comfortable with SF and MF and, and thought it would be too far a stretch from backwards compatibility to change it. I would have preferred things like uh, uh, floats and orientation array and, and things like that. but. Uh, uh, calmer heads prevailed. We do work by consensus, and so that probably was the right choice because that's what everybody uh, felt. But at least I'll whine that it's not my fault if you don't like those names. Can't emphasize enough that if you mismatch the data types, it will screw up. And that's so important because it may not be detected until runtime, which means you're not the one detecting it. The user is detecting it. Oh, and they might not say, that was an SF rotation instead of uh, uh, SF vec 3F. No, no, they'll say, why didn't this work? What's wrong here? Okay, so we've got to get those right. Okay, when uh, we say strong, that means exact. It must be correct. We can't be loosey-goosey. There are some systems that have what's considered weak data typing, and they, they work very hard at this, and it's, it's very well motivated. The idea is, well, why do we make the programmer work so hard to get the answer exactly right? Good enough should be good enough. If they can get something that we say, well, okay, you, you gave me a, a value 1.0, but you really wanted to say integer 1. I should be able to figure that out as a computer. Well, there's, there's merit to that argument. But as it turns out, it's pretty language specific. And it's sometimes possible and sometimes not. And, and like any slippery slope, the, the hard part is deciding where do you stop. And for even in the, in the, the pretty effective loosely typed languages that are out there, 
you know, nine times out of ten, it works fine, everybody's happy, no problem. But you find with experience that the times it doesn't work, it doesn't tell you it doesn't work. It just does something else that it thought you wanted, but is not what you wanted. And so that can be pretty maddening, tracking down, debugging, diagnosing and fixing those types of errors. So this is why uh, we've avoided it. Could you do some of it? Yes, you could make a case. We don't allow it because we want the 3D behaviors to be exactly right. Further, since we're a web language, we have a bit of a higher bar to meet. It's not just uh, uh, Johnny and Joni programmer that we're trying to satisfy, but we're trying to put 3D out there as part of web pages and things like that. So we want it to be rock solid when it lands. We want it to work because they're not going to say, <coughs> I've debugged your problem. Rather, they'll say, hmm, I got this funny error. must be broken. And you know what? They'd be right. Okay. So we think the benefit from avoiding those mysterious runtime errors far outweighs any cost. And oh, by the way, you have to get it right anyway. So why don't we get it right instead of hope we get it right? Okay, so for completion, I've, uh, completeness, I've copied a table out of the book here. It lists the various field types. Also gives you a few values, example values, so you can see what they look like. Notice that um, it's worth pointing out that some of these, although they say single field SF, it's an atomic data type, it's still got three values, okay? So a color is got to have three values, red, green, and blue. This is maybe a good example of why we don't have loose data typing. What if there were only two numbers there? You could say, well, if there's only two numbers, that's your red and green. Okay, but maybe it was red and blue or green and blue, or most likely the third value is missing. And that third value is in the second position. Okay, so this is why we're so strict about that. This is why when you go up to arrays of these things, uh, sorry, when we go up to arrays of colors, for example, there are two right there. They must have an integer number of either three or four values because it's an array. And each element of the array is itself a data type that must be strictly met. OK, some more data types here. Some are not used very frequently. But they're still available. MF image, for example, you won't find a node uh, that directly supports that, but you might write a script that wants to have an array of images and flip through them. Similarly, MF time, an array of timestamps, we typically don't have those. We, we don't need those. But you might decide to write a script that does it. So this is why we've been fairly complete in our definition of types. And finally, uh, in addition to the array types of doubles, we've added array types, excuse me, in addition to the classical arrays of floats, we've also added corresponding arrays of doubles for the few cases, such as geospatial, when you need to work in double precision arithmetic. Point out here that uh, if you're a fan of good old uh, virtual reality modeling language, either Vermal 97 or classic Vermal, that we do have one or two differences. We changed the, uh, the uppercase to lowercase on true and false. That's because uh, we want to match XML, which is lowercase true and false, be the same. Also, uh, we don't any longer need the square brackets that you see in Vermal and classic Vermal. And some of the special XML constructs for character entities that's the formal name for the escape characters. 
those do not exist in the classic vermal encoding. You would just use the special characters themselves. <coughs> okay, so that's type, data type, sometimes called field type. So that's pretty straightforward, at least pretty familiar. Here's, here's something else now. We've had these all along, but we haven't paid too much attention to them. And this is access type. And this says, do we produce, do we receive, or could it be a mix? Okay, so four access types. And uh, notice when we say match, we, we are talking about input, routed, to output. We want to be careful to put the right things in the right place. And since we're also comparing back to Vermal, We can see that the nomenclature here changed a little bit too. The functionality, the concepts are identical to Verbal 97, <laughs> and they are updated in X3D and in classic Verbal. But uh, the names changed a little bit to be clearer. And the interesting uh, part of this was we found that the old names were pretty awkward to use in a sense, because uh, we use the word field for a lot of things. You know, a field is uh, defined as having uh, a variety of things to it. It has a name, it has a data type, it has an access type, it has an initial value. But when we say the field has an access type of field, it makes for a pretty convoluted sentence sometimes. So. Uh, this is why we changed to a clearer nomenclature for X3D. So classic formal, 3.0 and above, this is the terminology we use. <coughs> now, if that weren't enough, there's one more variation in terminology, and that is the shorthand that's used in the X3D specification. Um, we use uh, these abbreviations in there. So if you're reading the spec directly, this is how you decode it. Uh, they're talking either about input only, output only, initialize only, or input output. Okay, now what else can we say about access type? Well, when we're naming fields, when we give them a name, a lot of times the field name itself can reveal what the underlying access type is. We'll use the word set underscore as a prefix if it's being set, if it goes into value. Similarly, underscore and changed would be appended to the name. If a field value changed in the scene graph, then the field name underscore changed would be the thing that gets routed to something else. Okay, and since uh, uh, changed uh, is a little awkward, we just say uh, is. We use is as a prefix when it's a Boolean field. So is active is our example there. Now, a key thing to remember here is that fields that only receive inputs at runtime <coughs> or only produce outputs at runtime cannot be saved out in the file. They can't appear in your X3D file. They can't appear in your classic Vermal or even your Vermal 97 file. They don't make sense because they only exist at runtime as destinations for routes or as sources for routes, okay? So if you ever see a field name with one of these in a file, it's a mistake, okay? And it should not pass validation, okay? So once you get these conventions down, uh, it should be a little bit easier to understand what's going on. And indeed, it'll be easier to design your own fields, your own nodes, when we're putting together scripts and later when we're putting together prototypes. So naming, very important. OK, so now we're ready to look at the 10-step process. And I think what we'll do, 
is we'll first do a very quick pass through all 10 steps, and then we will uh, do a more detailed second pass in terms of what they are. Now, this 10-step uh, process is usually overkill for any route that you might put together. The trick, though, is which steps do you need for which route, okay? So rather than being silent about, well, we do it this way for this and that way for that, we've come up with a comprehensive set of steps that you can use for any routing, any animation behaviors. And it's okay if two or three or four of the questions are not applicable because it varies depending on the circumstances. So this is the pattern that will help. And this helps you decide when you say, okay, I know I want to change this node right here. How do I do that? How do I get there from here? How do I figure out all the pieces, parts? The 10-step process will bring you through. Okay, so first step, picking a target. We try to decide what is it we're going to do. So the key part of this picture is that guy right there. What is the node in the scene graph that we're targeting to change? You may know this as start with the end in mind. If we know where we're going, then it becomes easier to pick the right road. Okay, second thing we do, very easy step. Let's give it a name. Since, since we know it's going to get a value routed to it, let's give a name to that node so the routes will work. Okay, third. Oh, yeah, yeah, those pesky rules. We've got to check our data type. We've got to check our access type. All right, so let's figure out for our target what does it accept. And is that a legal field that we've picked to modify? Maybe we picked the wrong one. Maybe it's one of the few cases where a field is not modifiable at runtime and we can't change that. Okay, once you've figured out that it's either input only or input output, the key parts of those being input and input, meaning it's ready to receive, then we could say, well, what was the field value on that? And we'll see there are a couple of ways to look those values up. Next we decide what type of connector node, what type of function box are we going to use? If it's uh, integer or if it's Boolean, then we're going to use a sequencer node. If our target is to produce another node itself, then we would have to use a script. In most cases, we'll find that this is not applicable, but occasionally it is. But we'll eliminate this first, and that lets us get on to the next question, which is, well, if it's not using a sequencer, if it's not using a script node, which was step four, aha, then we must be using floating point, and we need to use an interpolator, one of the floating point types. Okay, and then we can use a lookup table to say which node is it that will feed us. Next we get to decide, do we use a trigger or not? Do we care? Sometimes things just run by themselves. Other times we want to sense user interaction. This is the time to determine that. Then we say, okay, clock. We're going to need a clock for almost every behavior. That's what lets it run from frame to frame to frame. Let's decide what kind of clock are we using? How much of an interval does it have? Is it looping repeatedly or not? Okay. Now that we've done those first seven steps, we're ready to start hooking it up. So we'll hook up a route to the trigger, if it exists, if we needed a trigger. We'll hook up another route to connect the time sensor clock to our interpolator, or connect the time sensor to the uh, sequencer. And then finally, we take that output value that's producing, the node that's producing the output values, and we hook it up to our target. What was the scene we're trying to change? And then, boom, presto, we're done. Okay, and if you've been following the steps as you build our scene, 
then you're ready to test it. So we will look at that next time we're together. Okay, so let's go to our chapter review. We've gotten through the first three along with some good terminology. We'll repeat this guy again and then we'll, we'll focus on clocks and actually hooking these things up next time. I'll see you then.